Kurotate. Um, we should make a start because it's past the start time. Today, tonight, the Chaki Kimiachi Kakoto Kotai Mai de Ayahima Kina Koto. I get the title of Mami Kumi in Tatane, Mami Kiruna Kira of Kiwa Kiroko, Mami Hukiki Kotato Kimi, and Tuna Fano with the Koko for Tina Kira of Kimi Kami. あの、ちの、ちの、僕やきてみやつ、あの、聞いとたたい、パイコロを置いて、あいやいない。あ、気まくしゃ、気まくやもん。あ、気まくいく。あ、え、え、ワイマリオのたたいてらない、いるのいて
Ki tēnei whenua o tainui nei, tēnā koe. Ki te maunga tapu o taupari e tū atu rā, tēnā koe. Ki a rātou, kua whitu rangitia, moe mai rā, moe mai rā. Ki tā tātou kingi, tū heitia, mea o whānau, tēnā koutou. Ki te wānanga o waikato, tēnā koutou. Ki a koutou, me nā rangatira, mā i noho mai rā, mō nā kaupapa i hui hui tātou, mō te rā nui, mō tā tātou kingi. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kei te kō taku nā kou. I feel very privileged to be standing here today to present to you on such a special day for Tainui. I ask you all to please forgive the nerves um, and hopefully what I have to share with you this afternoon will provide an understanding of how scams occur and why they are so successful. I intend to talk about my own experience. I've tried to um, put uh, about a three year experience into uh, maybe half of the presentation wasn't easy to do, so there will be lots of gaps, um, but I hope you get the gist of what I'm trying to share with you today. Uh, so in order to get to the crux of this presentation, it's important that I go back and set a scene. What you probably know is that in April 2011, I was arrested at Isaza Airport in Buenos Aires, Argentina, with five kilos of cocaine concealed in a suitcase. What you may not know was how vulnerable I was in the preceding months. So vulnerable that I ignored a number of warning signs. Did I know at the time there were indications of a scam happening? No. What I did know was there were some bad things that happened across the internet, or could happen, but you know, it wasn't going to happen to me. I also know that if I'd not been in such a vulnerable space, then I may not have fallen so deeply in love with a charming persona called Frank Mark Linus. So how did this happen? I'm multitasking now between. <coughs> I left a great career in Aotearoa to move to be by my whānau in Brisbane in the middle of 2010. The next few months were spent looking for work. I was consistently told I was overqualified for the various positions I was applying for and over the next six months, I became more and more desperate. At the end of October, a well-meaning cousin of mine signed me up to a dating site, Match.com. I was not overly happy with this and found it all a little creepy, actually, so I decided that I would unsubscribe from the site. My profile was to remain live for a further three days. It was in this time that I received a message from a very handsome-looking man. His first mes message to me had me hooked like I'd never been hooked before. To cut a very long and sordid story short, I fell hard and fast. I should have recognised the grooming that was occurring. In a previous life, I worked within corrections, and I had many in an encounter with a sex offender and opportunities to study their techniques. But no, I had my rose-coloured glasses on. We seemed to have so much in common, although a lot of difference as well, which made it all so much more exciting. He told me he only lived about 45 minutes away from where I was staying in Brisbane. He told me he was a civil engineer. His fiance had been killed in a car accident some eight years earlier, uh, some years earlier, and his mother had worked for the UN in human rights, but had died eight years previously. He was an only child and had loved his mother. He had spent most of his childhood living in various countries around the world. He was alone, and he told me he loved my strong commitment to my whānau, and he could tell I was an honest person with the same values as him. He would talk about how excited he was to be a part of such a loving whānau. We were meant to meet about a week after we first started talking online. However, on the big day he rang most upset to say he was going to Sydney for a job interview. If successful, it would mean a big contract in London. He later called to say he'd landed the job, and if I supported his decision to go, he needed to leave immediately. Of course I said go. He needed work. He made contact as soon as he arrived in London. <laughs> 
With the benefit of hindsight, I now understand they find out what they can about you via social media, places like Facebook, <coughs> Instagram, Twitter, search engines. And due to my previous role at the Māori Language Commission, photos and stories already came up when my name was Googled. Probably not as many as come up now. So, I'm being groomed over a period of five months. The journey consisted of many highs and probably just as many lows in hindsight. Remember, we now have this benefit. His contract fell over by Christmas and the first request for money came. He then begins to warm me up to the idea of doing some contracting work with him as his PA. Really his fiance, he says. How funny is that, I think. Me, who has never held any intention of ever actually marrying anybody again, once was enough in my book, because if it didn't last for a lifetime, then why would I do it again? However, I was being excited by the thought of this man wanting to marry me. He even told me he'd seen a wedding dress in a shop window that he wanted to buy for me. Really? Sometimes this benefit of hindsight's not really a benefit at all. I think I'd rather have amnesia for some of these memories. Throughout January, there was one issue after another, with his, pre from his previous workers threatening him due to money they were owed, through to him falling gravely ill and ending up in a hospital and remaining there for three weeks, ensuring an ever-increasing list of problems arising. In February, I was offered a short-term contract back in New Zealand, timely really, because by this stage I had already sent most of my savings to him via Western Union a service I had never used previously to this. So a job back in New Zealand meant I could help to support him while he secured another contract. So by the end of March he convinces me to travel to South America to pick up some papers for a new contract he was being offered to do some civil engineering type work for a company who did check out when I did a Google search. However, about six weeks after my arrest the company was no longer listed. So I make arrangements, all excited and apprehensive at the same time. I organise some work commitments I had and finally I tell my whānau. They weren't happy about my going, but hey, at 53, no one was really going to tell me what to do. I'm going via Argentina. So I Google to check out some information about the country. They speak Spanish, or a derivative of. Later I found out it's Castellano. Um, <coughs> So I think, well, I've been to Spain, I know Hula, I know a little bit, I'm only staying there for a very short time, so I didn't stress too much about that. Ha ha, again, benefit of hindsight. <coughs> Meanwhile, the love of my life continues to charm me. He tells me of the time when we will meet for the first time, how we will spend our time in London before returning with me to New Zealand if all went well. Why wouldn't it go well? We knew each other intimately by this stage. We'd been speaking for five months and shared things I've never shared with anybody. So I arrive in Argentina and here is where another level of their cleverness comes in. Originally only stopping over for a couple of days at most, suddenly <coughs> everything changes and they want me to fly to Switzerland to pick up some more papers then to travel by train down to Madrid. So feeling very stressed by this stage, waiting for the papers to be delivered, and then to have the plans keep changing, my stress was skyrocketing. In comes my saviour, who says to me, don't worry honey, honey. They, they was a woman by the name of Esperanza Gomez, who was the secretary to the organisation that Frank was supposed to be working for. They can pick the papers up in Switzerland. You just bring the documents to London. I will fly to Spain, sign them, and return in time for your birthday. A week later, the night before my flight to London, I'm given a suitcase with the documents concealed in the lining. I question both Frank and Esperanza as to why the papers are hidden. They come up with a variety of excuses. And Frank tells me, if I'm really concerned, honey, then lift up the lining and check out the documents. So with this response, I think, you're just being paranoid, Sharon, because you trust this man. 
and he is telling you how fabulous our life together will be. Also, upon my arrival, he was going to take the documents on to Spain, sign the contract and return to me within 24 hours. So I'm thinking, well if he had anything sus in the bag, then surely he wouldn't be offering to take it on to Spain. So next day I turn up and check in the bag and make it through customs. Then while waiting for the boarding announcement, my name is called and I am asked to identify my bag, which I do. And eventually, this all leads to me being arrested around 3pm that afternoon, Wednesday the 13th of April 2011. <clears throat> I remember not long after it hit the headlines, both here in New Zealand and also in Argentina, being horrified at the headlines using such words as drug mule. Not sure at that point I really knew exactly what one was, um, let alone being accused of being one. Such a learning experience in more ways than I have time to discuss here today. How did I get through being locked up in a prison in Argentina? I just want to I digress just for a moment because this morning I've sat through two presentations, both about the strength of our people, of Māori people back in World War I, both about the strength of the people here from the Kingitanga and, you know, I think I've answered that question. It's in our blood. The first few days were like living in a nightmare. Foreign country, didn't understand what was happening to me, where I was being taken, why I was being moved from cell to cell, what the other prisoners were trying to say to me. The day after my arrest, still in the same clothes, unshowered, I meet with the public defender and tell her what happened via a translator. So I tell all. By this stage, all my worst fears were realised. I knew my whanau would be panicking, as they would have been waiting for my call to say I was safely in London. In fact, by this stage, my whanau had contacted <coughs> Interpol to ask them to try and find out where in the world I was. Later that day, after hours and hours of repeating my story, the lawyers take me to their offices and I am able to phone my sister. Through many tears, she is relieved to hear I have been arrested and am still in Argentina because by this stage they were frantic with worry that I may be dead somewhere and they may never find me. The next day was my birthday. I turned 54, having spent the previous night and all of that day in a filthy cell, still unshowered and having to pee in a hole in the ground in front of other women. Finally, around 11pm that night, I'm taken to another prison, processed and put in a dormitory style unit with around 30 other women. Eventually after a very stressful weekend, I moved to Unidad Trentai Uno, a prison in Isaza where I remained for the next two and a half years. The first month was spent in another dormitory style unit with approximately 20 other women. The prison had a section especially for international drug mules. At any one time, there were around 60 international women locked up, with the total number of women in this particular prison totalling around 220. About four weeks after my arrest, I moved to a pavilion with on average nine other women. This prison, oh sorry, I had my own cell. So after a month of sharing, not feeling safe, my life being so very public, I felt like I'd won the lottery, to finally have a space where I could be alone. <coughs> Over the next 10 months, I had many trips back and forth to court. My case was finally heard in February 2012, and despite the judges acknowledging I was scammed, I was convicted and sentenced to four years and 10 months. I think everyone from my lawyers, the translator, my whanau, embassy staff, and even some of the court officials were more surprised with the judge's verdict than I was. My lawyers appealed, and there begins another story of how different the legal system in Argentina is to ours here in New Zealand. I won't go into any more detail around that, as I would need another few hours to explain. You'll have to wait for the book to come out. So, Finally, after appeals and unresolved legal issues with my sentence, I was finally able to return home, leaving Argentina on the 11th of October 2013, 
some 30 months after having arrived. My whānau met me at the airport and we travelled south to the maunga I had grown up under. Despite having slept under photos and postcards of maunga Taranaki, photos and postcards of and from my whānau and friends, nothing, nothing compared to actually being with them physically. To be able to do the things I would go to sleep at night dreaming of doing, simple things really, like being able to walk wherever and whenever I wanted, instead of being restricted to a small outside yard where I'd walk around and around and around in a circle. Has it been easy since my release? Hell no. Did I think it would be? Hell no. I'm currently unemployed again, but I'm finally working on something I feel very passionate about, which reminds me that I really thrive <coughs> when I know my mahi may make a difference. Do I get recognised? I've lost count of the number of times strangers have said to me, gee, I've met you somewhere before, your face looks so familiar. <laughs> I had it today, and forgive me if the person is in here, I didn't tell you. Um, sometimes I explain why they're likely to have recognised me, much to their horror and embarrassment, but often I just reply, oh, I have one of those common faces, and leave them pondering. So, while I've enjoyed spending the first 18 months since my return out of the spotlight of the media, I always knew it would only be a matter of time before that would change. When my scam hit the headlines in 2011, I had no control over how the media were portraying my story. This time, I like to think I do have some control over what is told and how it is told. When I was contemplating going public again, a very wise friend of mine told me, Shaz, this has happened to you for a reason. You've survived. You now need to work to prevent others from having to go through a similar experience. I know how hard it is to go public, <coughs> particularly with armchair critics, quick to judge and condemn. However, in many ways, I am grateful that I didn't have a choice as it has allowed me to deal with the shame and the hu humiliation and given me a determination to make a difference. One of the things I was unsure about was how to raise awareness. How to raise awareness by the telling of my experience. Initially, a book seemed like a good idea. I'd been writing a daily journal, which totaled 857 full scat pages by the time I left Argentina. However, I was not convinced that this method would reach a wide enough audience. So the idea of a campaign seemed a much better way. Again, do I think this will be easy? Hell no. Campaigns can take years to get off the ground. And I guess that worries me as I've become increasingly aware of the number of scams and scammers that continue to plague and claim victims every day. Since the Marae story went to air in early July, I've been overwhelmed by the heartbreaking stories of victims who have either made contact or have been referred to me or whom I've read about. What concerns me even more are those victims out there who are too afraid or too ashamed to talk about their experiences. We have to stop the shame and realise that the scammers are the ones to blame, not the victims. <laughs> Queensland Fraud Squad Chief Detective Superintendent Brian Hay, who has for many years been working in this area of work, has said that scams target people of all backgrounds, ages and income levels. He said everyone who is connected to the internet was vulnerable to online scams, particularly through increased social media use. It is the biggest challenge facing law enforcement globally in the history of policing, he said. One of the greatest vulnerabilities is our own behaviour. People post too much personal information online. It is very easy to make yourself an unintentional target simply by using social media. <coughs> Mr Hayes said people needed to be more cautious with the information they posted online, especially when using social media. 
You would not go out in the middle of the street and give out a dossier of your life to every stranger that walked by, you said. But you have no problems posting it on the internet for the whole world to see. You are constantly under attack from the moment you connect to the internet and you may not even know it, he said. As part of my huge learning curve, I have developed relationships with a number of individuals and organisations who have been working in the area of scamming for a very long time. One of these relationships is with NetSafe New Zealand and I would like to acknowledge Chris Hales who is here today and the awesome work he and his team undertake. The volume of calls they receive are astounding. Last year on average there were 22 calls a day. Over $8 million was lost to scammers from New Zealanders in 2014 and this year is shaping up to be even more horrific with the same amount having been lost by the end of August. So with four months still remaining. And please remember these statistics do not include what goes unreported so we can only imagine how many more victims and how much more money <coughs> goes overseas to these scammers. As for the variety of scams, a quick search brings up computer virus scams, online trading scams, banking and phishing scams, computer hacking, online dating scams, employment scams, investment scams, upfront payment scams, lottery and competition scams, mobile phone, flatmate scams, holiday and travel scams, charity scams, health and medical scams, small business scams, door-to-door -door scams and social media scams. These are likely to just be the tip of the iceberg. And while we don't have time to discuss all these scams today and how they work, I thought given my experience I would provide a summary of how romance scams work. A romance scam occurs when a man or woman pretends to be romantically interested in someone who is looking for love or friendship on an internet dating or social media site in order to obtain financial gain. The scammers generally target those aged between 35 and 70. Scammers copy and paste photos of attractive women and wealthy businessmen from anywhere across the internet and present these fake profiles to lure in their victims. They use poetic scripts to play the role of the romantic, sweet, kind, caring and considerate lover. The victim feels that they've found the partner of their dreams and the person they want to spend the rest of their life with and will go to great lengths to be with the one they love. Once the emotional attachment is strong, the scammer claims misfortune in some manner. A car accident, a mugging, a hospital inpatient, loss of wallet and paperwork, money needed for their business, sick mother, sick child, needs medical bills paid, birthday gifts, tuition fees, or their hotel was burnt down with all their paperwork and belongings now destroyed. They will appear forlorn and encourage the victim to help them financially by making money transfer through one of the major money movers like Western Union or MoneyGram and ask that it be kept quiet for fear of embarrassment to the victim's family upon meeting them. The victim feels uncomfortable at the speed of the developing relationship pace but develops a strong emotional attachment to their sweet words of love. Family members may become alarmed when they discover financial transactions taking place between the victim the manipulative scammer and the victim's family sorry, may become critical of the developing relationship. The relationship tends to become secretive and a triangle develops between the victim, the manipulative scammer and the victim's family. The scammer will attack disapproval by introducing doubt and will answer with a question or just drop out of the communication if confronted. Most victims find it hard to resist the pull towards the scammer's seduction. <clears throat> Due to the heavy pattern of romantic attention the scammer has created and many will lose financially before their illusion is broken or arrested as in my case, often resulting in a physical, spiritual and emotional breakdown. A romance scammer will use any type of communication to carry the scam, <coughs> such as Facebook, WhatsApp, email, phone, text, prayer sites, dating sites, Yahoo groups, forums, some portraying themselves as victims of scams, police or political representatives and military personnel. With regards to dating sites, 
Currently, the dating site owners are asked to display warnings on their sites about scam profiles. However, many either can't or don't want to recognise these fake profiles. Many are not fully aware of what they are complying with, as administrators lack the knowledge or a part of the marketing to pull in more profiles for membership or advertising purposes. Some dating site owners appear to have no problem operating fraudulently because there is nobody policing them. As we were made aware with the Ashley Madison scandal, many dating sites have fake profiles. In fact, many dating sites pay people to develop these fake profiles. I believe the fight against scammers is really only just beginning. We need to stay vigilant and we need to keep talking about these issues and ensuring we are all keeping ourselves and those we love and care about up to date with the scammers and their latest victims. So in conclusion, this campaign is about standing up to scams and scammers by shifting the spotlight from the vulnerable to the corrupt. By achieving this, I believe more people will speak out publicly about their own experience without being vilified by the media and or the general public. This in turn will increase awareness. Simple really. So how can you help? If you're on Twitter, please follow me or like my Facebook page and share the tweets or posts as I'm regularly hi highlighting stories or warnings of scams. If you would like to talk about your own or someone else's experience, please feel free to contact me at my Gmail address. If you think you may be being scammed right now, then also please make contact. If not with me, then please contact NetSafe New Zealand, who will also be able to assist. Unless you agree to sharing your story or content, and contact will be kept strictly private. If we work together to identify, name <coughs> and shame the scammers and their corrupt scams, we may prevent others from having to face some harsh consequences such as a result of their often trusting natures. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, katoa. So if you have questions for Sharon, hang on to them for now. We'll get Sharon back up shortly. We're just going to hear from Armand um, now. Kia ora tātou, <coughs> uh, e honore nui uh, tēnei ki te kingitanga, te heitia, uh, uh, me te whānau, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, ko tāma nei tēnei rā, e kui mai e koroma e rauranga tēnā mā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, my name is Armand Tamatia, I'm based here at Waikato and um, teach clinical psychology here at the School of Psychology and um, uh, thank you to Tucker for the, for the call up and for Sam for hosting us. Um, and also to you, Sharon, for your very powerful testimony about your experiences. Very harrowing indeed. I was thinking Bangkok Hilton, you know, when you started talking about that stuff. I'm loving it. But um, yeah, uh, this is a very, I think, very topical issue that will probably touch a lot of us, or not most of us, uh, to one degree or another. So I've rather dramatically called this for you all. Your freedoms are endangered, just ask your smartphone. <coughs> now, who remembers this movie? Planet of the Apes. The original, not that, uh, you know, the more recent. Bollocks, but um, this, this film, right, I mean, it was about um, these three astronauts who travel through time and space to another planet, or do they? And, um, and then they realise that the rules have changed, that uh, humanity no longer run the place, but these apes do. But the, the core message here was that there was a new world order. Rules have changed, things have changed. So, in some respects, has crime. <coughs> this is what crime used to look like once upon a time, right? You know, we used to have kind of these ideas and tropes, and, and some of the stuff still exists now, but these days, the picture may well be changing to looking something a lot like this. So <coughs> the more connected we're getting, and a lot of the issues that uh, Sharon mentioned before, I mean, we're in an age of uh, expanding and continued connectivity and engagement with the, new, with the new media and a digitalized kind of world. So why should we care about cybercrime? Well, one, um, because this stuff's so commonplace, there's lots of benefits for us to access the internet, which is pretty much probably everyone in this room. 
But as long as there are people and as long as there are systems, there will be opportunities for crime as well. Uh, and so the internet is a platform not only for the commission of offences, but also for the prevention of offences as well. So the, the three big kind of challenge areas, I think, this is just some armchair music really around cybercrime, is firstly <coughs> to look at appropriate legislation, policy and law enforcement practices to deal with these new types of, of crimes. Um, these aren't the normal crimes. They weren't doing cybercrime back in the 1800s or let alone in the 1970s. You know, these, these are whole new kinds of crimes, at least variations on old crimes in a new kind of environment. Um, also, new practices in the forensic corrections and criminal justice uh, agencies and sector, as well as what we can do as a public, who are likely to be the end users and maybe victims, if not actual offenders perhaps in this space, possibly or otherwise. So the first thing we need to do is consider what are the types of crimes. I won't go through this in depth because I suspect many in this room probably have a lot more knowledge in this area than I do, but um, uh, David Wall, who was a criminologist who kind of came into this area on the ground floor in the early 2000s, uh, created a type of typology, so I'm just going to use that just to make life a little easier. It, um, there were kind of four general kind of categories of cybercrime. The first is cyber trespass, which is when effectively someone crosses their border of ownership into yours, so hacking basically would be the classic kind of cyber trespass crime, uh, also either to gain something you have or to stop you getting something that you have, for example. There's cyber dece uh, deception and theft, so there's everything from piracy, credit card fraud, identity theft and the notorious Nigerian scams, of course, as an example. Uh, there's also cyber porn and obscenity, and which I think explains itself, and um, also cyber violence, which is maybe one of the more insidious kinds of crimes that the internet is now creating something of a medium in order to be able to effect. So we have kind of popular versions of this, which is a captive show on MTV, but also um, uh, child pornography and um, the, uh, the incidence of what may be the growing prevalence of um, child sex offenders who are accessing victims via um, social media networks and whatnot. So critical knowledge areas. <coughs> who commits these crimes? We need to know something about who these, this offender group is. And one of the big issues with cybercrime, while I can tell from the literature and uh, talking with those who are involved in this space, this is one of the most invisible criminal groups that exist. I mean, uh, my own background, for example, is in criminal justice. I've worked for corrections for 10 years. Uh, a lot of my work was based in prisons. You can spot a violent offender more or less a mile off. Um, they're invariably, invariably male, usually between late teens and uh, maybe late twenties. They'll often have a history of violence, may well be associated with uh, a criminal network of some sort, but usually in a way that's quite obvious. Um, child sex offenders have their own kind of conspicuous sort of telltale signs in some ways as well, but when it comes to cyber criminals, who is this group exactly? And what are the barriers to finding out more about this particular community? Uh, similarly, who are the victims? And uh, Sharon gave us a, a wonderful uh, corridor about her experience as one such individual. But there are also barriers to finding out who these victims are. One, because um, the, 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 the negative payoffs for being a victim through these kinds of offences may not be worth reporting on. So I'm glad you raised the point about under-reporting certain kinds of um, negative outcomes as a victim of this. But what are the issues around uh, who these individuals are, who they're victimised, how they're being targeted, and why. How do we predict cybercrime? Uh, which I guess is kind of self evident. This is, um, we, we, can, we, we know cybercrime by its effects through financial loss, through um, uh, 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 some kind of sexual abuse or emotional abuse, psychological abuse online. We, we know these crimes through their effects, but how can we predict this kind of stuff? And how do we prevent it? And um, in some respects, I think maybe more energy has gone into prevention than maybe prediction at this point. So, <coughs> the remainder of this, I just want to give a ridiculously brief crash course in criminal psychology. I can't call myself a psychologist, not to go psychology. Now, typically, <coughs> and this, this will hopefully raise some of the issues around why cybercrime is so difficult to kind of tackle. When we think about crimi a criminal history, for example, we often measure crimes in terms of actual events. So, imagine time, however you want to measure that. Just pretend these are armed robberies. So occurs at this point in time and another one occurs by the same person and maybe there's a series of these so we have a pattern of behaviour and we can count those. How do you count cybercrime? Someone sends off an email, the offence itself may not be apparent until days, weeks, months later perhaps down the track. <coughs> the other thing we want to look at, with each of these instances of crime, these actual uh, discrete uh, moments of behaviour, what were the features that were packed around that for the individual who committed these offences? So for example, with, um, say with a child sex offender's analogy, the individual may be sexually aroused, 
There may be an absence of adults around. There may be the presence of a desirable victim. Uh, a person may be somewhat intoxicated, which then disinhibits that behavior. Um, they may then start uh, engaging in self, self talk, some kind of permission giving talk, which um, reduces the dissonance the person may be experiencing between being a good guy who's about to do something really terrible. So, all this kind of bullshit the person tells themselves to reduce that gap between who I am as a person and what I'm about to do. So, <coughs> these are kind of the stuff that we as psychologists try and tease out when we interview somebody for these kind of behaviours. But often this occurs post sentence. <coughs> Very difficult to detect a sex offender before they've actually committed an offence at all. And that's part of the tragedy of this kind of work, is it often relies on the history of quite tragic events before we can start making some real kind of concrete predictions. So generally speaking, <coughs> with crime generally, we look at a number of factors. So these are little blue bars surrounding the, the big ones. What are the most reliable predictors of these kinds of behaviours? Now with general crime, and this is where we might need to start asking you questions about whether this really applies to cyber criminality. Strong predictors would be if someone has attitudes or beliefs which are supportive of criminal behaviour. So if I think criminal behaviour is good for me for some reason or another, uh, that's probably likely to put me a step closer than, say, yourself from committing uh, an antisocial act. Having people around you who tacitly or directly support your attitudes or your actions or maybe applaud your behaviour if you spat someone over, for example, so you that's a bloody good job, then that may actually reward your um, behaviour and your laws of behaviour more likely to do that again in the future. All things being equal. Probably one of the oldest psychological laws of all is uh, the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour. So if you've done things in the past and it's paid off, at least someone or something has intervened in that process, you're likely to doing that again, whether it's um, um, armed robbery or whether that's an assault or a fight, it's likely to appear somewhere in the future, all things being equal. And the, the fourth one, I'm probably most contentious, is this idea of antisocial personality, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a second, which is when a constellation of traits, reasonably innocuous in and of themselves, but when they start to cluster together, we have kind of a heady cocktail that can be um, quite, quite uh, challenging to deal with. So the big four. <coughs> As mentioned, well, the history of antisocial behaviour, the attitudes, uh, the associations, and personality. This is an armchair kind of um, typology. This is a psychologist who masqueraded as David Attenborough at some point and decided, right, let's, uh, let's just make out that the criminal community are like an animal genus and species and whatnot. <coughs> so we have normal offenders. These could be folk who offend because they have some kind of survival issue attached to that. They offend to feed their families, for example. They, they, they shoplift, they rob because they're impoverished. There's a whole lot of social drives that might be informing that. This could also be a group who are actually are innocent of crimes, but have been found to be guilty for whatever reason. Um, there are the psychotic offenders, those who um, uh, uh, suffer from schizophrenia, for example, especially command hallucinations. This is a very rare group, incidentally, and I don't want to demonize that group any further. In fact, your chances of being assaulted, if not murdered, um, are very low if you are sharing a, a bedroom with someone who has psychosis, for example, than someone who doesn't. I think if you have dampened insurance, it's a really high risk that someone's likely to take you out. And then on the, <coughs> the end here is the, what we call the antisocial personalities. So these are almost a pathologically different group in some ways. There are those who maybe have um, basic kind of character defects in life that predispose them to um, Certain kinds of things, they could be impulsive, they don't think things through very well, and that's their normal kind of way of behaving, so uh, hence crime may be a side effect of that kind of style of interacting. There are the so-called sociopaths <coughs> who are chronically antisocial, largely due perhaps to a really screwed up learning history and um, a whole lot of other environmental factors that may encourage that behaviour and so forth. But then we have um, the big sexy buzzword of the day, the so-called psychopaths, um, who are similar in some respects to the sociopaths, but there may be some genetic component. The jury's still out on that, but this is a very interesting group. But are we entertainers of cyberpaths, maybe? But there's actually another group that we haven't, we've discovered a new species of offender, perhaps, that um, you know, exists somewhere out there that we're just starting to discover now. In some ways exciting, but in some ways disturbing. Or is it that this group are really a kind of a digitalized version of maybe all these other kinds of categories over here? So from a risk assessment point of view, we need a model of cyber criminality, a, a robust theoretical model 
Because from then we can make predictions. And with those predictions, we can develop tools and things that will make life easier when it comes to um, protecting and preventing these kinds of behaviours. <coughs> so the basic logic of um, specifying risk, just identifying someone as simply a cyber criminal, doesn't really tell us very much at all. It can range from someone who's um, maybe ripped off uh, someone's bank account at one end to someone who's maybe um, uh, preying on children sexually at the other end. No one is actively criminal to everyone all the time. This, work, this is the same for violent offenders, sexual offenders, and arguably for cyber criminals as well. People have to sleep for God's sake, so surely during that period there's no offending going on. <coughs> we also have to specify um, if prediction is to have value, what are the factors that encourage a person to act in a criminal manner? Um, we often hear this phrase about the criminal mind. Uh, my argument here, I'm certainly open to being educated on this, is that we should dis dispel all notions of mind, especially criminal mind, because we don't know what goes on in mind, but we do know what goes on with behaviour. We can see behaviour, we can measure that to a certain extent. Mind is a much more murky manner. Anyone can have a criminal mind as such, but, um, but it's not our minds that commit offences, it's our behaviours that commit offences. Um, the second bit here is the type of behaviour. So these are those classic kind of David Wall categories I mentioned before. Also the type of victims. So the holy grail kind of place we might need to get to, and I don't know if we're going to get there with any real certainty, is this whole idea of a risk parameter statement. <coughs> so if the following risk factors are present, whatever those are, for a given individual, then there is a high, medium or low descriptive probability that the person will engage in some specific behaviour, romance, scam, um, uh, sexual uh, predatory behaviour online within a certain period of time, whether that's next few months, next few years, that may place certain victims at risk of a certain type of severity of those outcomes. So there's a, there's a lot in there, but that's what we call a risk parameter statement. So I'm not simply saying this guy's at risk of doing some shit, but rather this is someone who's at risk of doing quite a specific series of actions that may have a certain kind of impact on a certain kind of person. So my last slide, what does all this mean? <coughs> and this is just, again, some more armchair musings. But cybercrime, like other crimes, at the very least defines the edges of what we're willing to tolerate as a society and as a community. <coughs> and because of the pervasiveness both of the incident, but maybe the mystique equally of the incident, we still need to find out what those boundaries are for us. From a criminal justice point of view, detection, prediction, and prevention are three kind of core areas that I would argue demand a lot of um, attention in terms of what roles that these service providers would play, universities, government institutions, as well as broader community. And so organisations like NetSafe, for example, and um, other kinds of groups um, may well be doing a lot for those efforts. So I'd be interested to start to get a bit of a bigger picture view of that, what's happening, especially in New Zealand. <coughs> but this is also, more excitingly, I guess, without glorifying any of this stuff, an opportunity to approach and explore the futurality of criminality. Now that we're moving to a new age as a society, maybe globally, with that, unfortunately, is the baggage of criminality. There's an opportunity to look a bit closer at what that will mean for us, um, and by extension, what it now means to be a citizen as part of this new developing kind of society. So there's some big picture issues. I'll leave it there. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And look forward to any questions my have. <laughs> So we've heard from the perspective of someone who's been involved with a crime and is doing something about it. We've heard from the perspective of the psychology um, outlook, the reasons and you know, how we can attempt to address it. Um, so now we want to hear from a computer scientist perspective. So that is why we have our main boom here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah, kia ora. Um, yeah, my name is Boom. Yeah, I, I like this name because, uh, you know, it's a taboo uh, name. Yeah, you cannot say this name or on plane. Yeah, please don't say. Okay. Um, yeah, scan up uh, two scans. Uh, thanks, um, Charon and Amon, yeah, to introduce a lot about yeah, the scan and cybercom. So I will not cover those topics. Okay. <laughs> By the way, uh, I just want to conclude first. I, Actually, we should introduce first, right? But let me conclude first. Um, I want to conclude that technologies cannot protect against scams. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's why I want to conclude. Uh, technologies are not smart enough to detect scams and scammers. Okay, why? 
Most technologies uh, I give you some examples. Protection technologies such as uh, antivirus software, uh, intrusion detection system, uh, firewalls. Those technologies use usually they use uh, signatures. Yeah. When I talk about signatures, actually it looks like high-end signature, but actually it's uh, patterns like patterns or identities of contents. For example, um, when uh, antivirus software want to find a scam uh, or email scam, okay, it just check if this email scam has pattern of uh, you know scam message or not, okay. But I could say that scammers, some scammers, or most of scammers are smarter than that, okay. They study how those techniques work, and then they try to avoid being uh, scanned or detected by those technologies, okay? Uh, let me ask you first, uh, I show you this um, example. I ask you first, this is the website of uh, Immigration New Zealand. Which one is the valid one? Uh, sorry, but most of you might, might not um, be foreigners, right? But for me, I need to visit this website. Okay, yeah, first time I need to visit this website, how to apply visa, work visa, and come to New Zealand. Okay, suppose I open a website, how I know that which one is the correct one? Okay, guess uh, left or right? Left. Left is the right one? Okay, who said left the right one? Okay, and who said the right? Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, if I give you more clues, which one is the right one? The left is the right one, right? Yeah. Why you say that? Why you say the left is the right one? You know the address is oh, awesome. Or the right one? Why the right one is not right? Mm, no advertisement. Ah, oh, interesting. But, but this one advertisement advertised New Zealand 2015. Uh, uh, up. <laughs> and it catch people who are come to New Zealand, right? Especially me, if uh, first time I visit uh, this website, suppose I'm a tourist. Wow, very really interesting. Uh, yeah, and then I apply, click apply now, and then this, this website might ask me uh, more personal information, <laughs> such as my first name, last name, date of birth, and blah, 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 right? Yeah. And I give you some of the technical terms here. Um, scammers use multiple techniques to get information from the victims, uh, such as uh, they might use uh, SEO. What is SEO? Uh, search engine optimization. Okay, for example, you, when you use Google to find, for example, find this website, okay, you want to see the real uh, immigration New Zealand website first, right? But how if they're Scammer use this technique called SEO to make the fake website show first. Yeah. Interesting, like if that website, the fake website show first, and if you don't know the real address of <coughs> immigration is that how you can protect yourself from being, you know, defrauded. Very scared, right? Yeah. Or use some advertisement, right? Okay, apply visa today, you will get work visa now. Yeah. Suppose, suppose, okay. If scammer use this advertisement, and advertisement is very cheap. I could say very cheap now. Okay, or uh, advanced technique. For example, you can use, uh, for example, if, if I'm scammer, I can use farming technique. Farming technique is a technique where I can redirect a uh, link or access for one uh, legitimate website to the fake one. Yeah. I can do that, I will not go to, to depth of the details. Okay, let me move to the next uh, example. Do you like free Wi-Fi or free internet access? Absolutely, most of us like free things, right? Uh, absolutely no free things in this world, like free Wi-Fi or free internet access. Because when you use free uh, access, you need to sell your own you know, personal information, okay? For so example, if, let's say here, we have free Wi-Fi, how I know they are free Wi-Fi? For example, they might show open, 
like this, and no uh, key lock uh, icon. Okay, uh, I secure the name. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Suppose uh, there are free Wi-Fi here, and then let's say free Wi-Fi at the UC of Waikato. Okay. Oh, it looks cool, and then I access this uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. Okay. Looks cool. Yeah, I can get the internet access. But what happened if this free Wi-Fi shows it web page, asks you to enter your username and password from Facebook account? Say, okay, before you use this free Wi-Fi, you need to access, uh, or sorry, to provide your uh, Facebook account username and password. Then, suppose you agree, you enter your uh, account name and password. Then the Wi-Fi provider can you know, get your real account. They can you know, pretend to be you later, can masquerade you, you see? Really dangerous. And I could say that now today, to make this kind of thing we call uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, sorry, Wi-Fi handy port is very easy. Okay, you just have a mobile phone. Where is my mobile phone, sorry. Yeah, like this, yeah, Android phone, okay. I don't do that at, at home, okay. <laughs> uh, you just have mobile phone and then you turn on Wi-Fi hotspot. Have you ever used that feature before? Share Wi-Fi access with others? Then you, if you know uh, some uh, simple programming, you just uh, do some program that can capture traffic. Okay, what I do next, okay? I set the Wi-Fi hotspot on the phone, say free Wi-Fi at the base. Okay, the base is shopping complex, right? Okay, free Wi-Fi at the base, okay? And then I lear, you know, victims to use this free Wi-Fi. Then I let my program to capture all the traffic coming to my phone. Very simple. Then I can know my victims more and more. I can get uh, the victims uh, profiles, personal information, <coughs> for example. Very dangerous. Ah, okay, next. I, I should not ask this question. Question, right? Do you want to be a millionaire? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just two days ago, this is my real Waikato account, you know, that you know. Yeah, uh, I received uh, this email two days ago yeah, from this organization, Financial Regulatory Office. Okay, just one line. Okay, very interesting. Kindly leave this uh, attached letter for details. Yeah. Uh, please do, don't do this at home again. Yeah, um, you can do, but if you have uh, you know good software protection, you can do at home. Okay, but yeah, yeah. Again, please don't try. Okay, I open the file. Okay, this this uh, email attached a file a letter. Okay, please don't open any attached file if you don't know the source. You know, uh, you, for example, you don't know who is guy. And even sometimes you know this guy, suppose your friend. Also, please don't open the file if you, for example, this one say, okay, kindly need the attachment letter for details. Hey, before my friend never used Kylie with me before, why one day they use Kylie? <laughs> yeah, you can, you know, uh, sometimes you use sense, right, to you know notice that uh, this email is with this thing. And then I open the letter, okay. Wow. What happened? Oh, I will be very rich. I will be a millionaire. Uh, this uh, financial declaratory office say, okay, they will compensate me money for what I don't know. Yeah, over two million, about two million, you know, uh, New Zealand dollars. Okay, very interesting. Then I scan, okay, the number is very interesting. And they say that they have actually been authorized by Minister of Finance, but from which country, I still don't know. Okay. And the uh, governing body of IMF, wow, IMF, yeah, just the name and then I check the logo, if that logo, IMF, logo, this logo belongs to which organization, you know? Yes, that's right, from UN, mm. that's true, okay, but if you read this letter, suppose you don't know, suppose again you don't know, this uh, logo is the fake one. It's not does not belong to financial regulatory office. What happened? It was a technologies cannot detect this kind of letter. Yeah, 
you need you need to aware of this, you know, problem of this scam by yourself. I could say, yeah. And the end of this letter asked me to provide my own uh, personal information, my date of birth. You might say, ah, it's simple. I also share my date of birth on Facebook. Why don't you know? Why I cannot give my date of birth? Hi, my date of birth here. Do you think date of birth, your own date of birth, is sensitive for you? You think it's is sensitive? I want to let people know my date of birth, you know, so I can get happy birthday every year. <laughs> yeah. I, I want, I want, I, I did want. <laughs> yes, yeah. It looks cool, but I could say that it's, mm, it's very sensitive. Scammers want to know this kind of information for what, you know. One day, suppose you reply all the information, the real information back to the scammer. The scammers might you know, use this information to pretend to be you. For example, call, uh, suppose I use ANZ, okay? Call ANZ, uh, okay, I want to transfer money from this account, from my account to the other account, okay? And then uh, the bank uh, teller will ask the scammer, right, uh, about information, my information, right? And uh, can you uh, 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 verify uh, date of birth? and then occupation, your address. Then the scammer can, you know, tell the teller the true information. You see, really, really dangerous, right? Yeah. Why well, I can notice something uh, fishy in this letter is that, okay, before they say they're from Mercury Finance Office, something like that, right? But why the, UR, the, domain, sorry, the domain of email address looks strange? collector.org mm. and then I try to access to this website don't do this at home okay <laughs> again because if this website is dangerous you might get you know some malicious software you know infect to your computer okay I access to the website collector.org and find that oh it's a fake one that's example and if you see it email this uh, of the sender, you find that it's from you know online collector at outlook.com. Looks very strange. Why they don't use their own, you know, domain name that is, say, UN. Okay, <laughs> if they reply by using UN, I might, I believe, you know, I might. <laughs> okay, yeah. Before we protect against uh, scammers, we need to understand how scammers work. Okay. Let's call this one scam, uh, scammer 101. Okay, I won't teach you how to be scam, okay? <laughs> scammer, but uh, just want you to know how scammers do, okay? Usually scammer won't work alone. Yeah. They work as a team, teamwork, okay? And they try to know the victims as Sharon and Amon just mentioned, okay? They're, uh, um, the victim usually posts their own information, their own information mention personal information on social media and then uh, the scammer learn about you from your own post okay and they check your victim history uh, weaknesses things what you like what you hate okay and be friend with you and try to get into your device if possible okay and try to get your secrets for example your sensitive data your password your credit card information or even your, you know, uh, secret photos, okay? And when the time is right, the scammer will take action. Okay, let me go uh, faster. Okay, how scammers know about you? Okay, let me conclude. There are many ways to do, okay? But I could say that uh, scammers know you because you provide information <laughs> to the scammer. Yeah. Uh, let you see this example. Uh, suppose I'm using Facebook and then I say, oh, today is so sad, I stay at home alone. Stay at home alone and ah, that's why this week I will be with my girlfriend in Wellington. And then I share my own address, suppose. Uh, you can share your own address, right? Uh, home address, okay? Soon said, if the scammer is a stalker, he can know, okay, this guy stay at home alone and next week he won't be home at home. 
Yeah, you see? Yeah, he might intrude my home next week. And he will learn me more and more, like uh, what I like, what I don't like, so he can send you know, email scams to me. Really scary, right? How to protect yourself? Okay, let me conclude, but actually, uh, Sharon mentioned that already. Uh, this one is the main, <laughs> yeah, it's the must, okay, uh, technique that you can protect yourself against um, scammers, that is, raise your own awareness, okay, and others' awareness as well, others' people awareness, okay, and also give them knowledge about cyber threats, okay. You could, you know, install protection software, for example, and develop software, and block, they could help you, more or less, okay, but not all. The main point is that you need to have awareness. Okay, that's all I want to uh, say today. Okay, thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is ask our three speakers to come up and take a seat. Um, and then we've got, we've got 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so. Um, to ask these guys questions and then we're going to call it a day. So, let me just, um, actually we'll leave that up there because that's quite a good slide. So has anybody got any questions? Um, I've got a question probably for the two gentlemen. I had a friend of mine who appeared to be um, getting lured in on a similar scam to what Sharon endured. And she noticed that when she was on the website, on the dating site, that when the guy wasn't speaking to her, that he was actively on the dating site. Mm. Is it common for the scammer in a romance scam to be online all day, having multiple relationships with people, and do they record the information so their responses are kind of almost automated, so they can access quickly who you're talking to? Would that be a, a valid scenario? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Let me answer first. Thank you. Uh, okay, yes, um, as I just mentioned, scammers usually uh, don't work alone. Okay, so uh, they work with others. Uh, they might not work 24 hours a day, right? Yeah, same as us. So um, maybe, yes, in the morning they work, they work this woman, and then they, you know, say, okay, uh, today I will. But you and then uh, I pass down this work to my <laughs> and another friend, uh, another scammer, you know, to continue uh, the, the scam. Okay, and uh, if you ask me, do we have any like uh, like court, right? Uh, I mean, for for the providers, I could say that some providers have, but most of them don't have. Yes, don't have like court about the you know the users of of uh, the dating uh, website. Okay, they may, might have record, for example, how many users uh, access to to the online today and how they have interaction, but they might record all the things. For example, uh, this guy uh, access in at, uh, in the morning, okay, and first this lady and chat with this, uh, these uh, messages, okay. Most of the dating that's are doing it, of course, kind of things. And I could say that uh, the UC of Baikato, okay, we're working on that. Yeah, they're working <coughs> on providing uh, so-called data provenance to record all their uh, messages, okay. Uh, and for the user self as well, the user can install this uh, software and then uh, the software can record uh, the messages. And you can both use those uh, messages uh, in court, for example. Thank you. Um, I suppose my top of my head thought on that would be uh, from a behavior point of view, if I was in the shoes, the, the fingers, I guess, of a, of a scammer on a dating site, um, if I could blast 50 women with uh, a certain message, and uh, say at least three or five come back, then not only do I get feedback on which of my messages is working, but also I might be shaped and what other kinds of additional responses might work as well. So. Um, arguably, uh, potential victims may inadvertently be shaped in the behaviour of would-be scammers, uh, especially of romance scams, for example, as to what responses work, which buttons will be pressed if I say this kind of stuff, for example. Um, I think that would be a, a behavioural risk to consider. 
um, maybe where the person may come unstuck is if you start getting some Congress messages, maybe the wrong person's name starts coming mm -hmm. into, you yes. know, um, that kind of thing. But I guess it could be a lot of averages type thing as well. You know, I wouldn't expect 50 women to reply, unless I was that fucking magical, to be honest, you know, by, by scamming. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> but if five or six come back, that's a pretty good average, right? You know, if that, yeah. that's kind of what I'm going for. So, yes. Yeah. subsequently um, and from others who are probably uh, more knowledgeable than I am in the whole area uh, yeah I think that uh, <coughs> the potential for a person ending up dead is a real reality um, in my nervousness I skipped about three paragraphs of the things about how I coped and one of that was learning to be grateful and I was very grateful that I never made, made it to my destination because there are stories of women who have been murdered, who have arrived at their destination, never made it back home. So I guess in terms of consequences there's probably nothing more um, serious than that at the end of the continuum. So um, I think my own knowledge of uh, where things are at currently, I think it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Because someone pointed out to me, and I thought it was a very good analogy, they talked about the business model of this. And they talk about the fact that there is minimal risk and minimal um, monetary input needed to be a scammer with the potential of high financial rewards. So, you know, that's an ideal business model to make money. So, you know, it's not going away. If I, if I can just add to that, an increased distance that's afforded through uh, scams means there's increased opportunity for what moral disengagement. Mm -hmm. If I'm not having to see my victim, for example, or be confronted by the harms, yeah. the direct harms that I'm actually doing, whether it's sexual harms, psychological harms, physical harms, then I personally don't get emotionally harmed by those potential scams, for example. Afford some kind of psychological distance from the behaviour of others. I would like to add to that. Um, if you look at other crimes, when it started, it was more individual. So, then, you know, okay, I, I know some programming, let me try to do this, let me try to hack into the system. But today, cyber crime is a lot more organised. It is organised crime, it involves uh, drug parties. And, uh, on top of that, it's, uh, most uh, many of these are, are multinational cyber crime organizations, yeah. like in Sharon's case. Um, they're not just, uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's not uh, there's just one single country where these, these people are. They have networks uh, from Russia, China, U.S., and all over the place. So, so it's, uh, you know, that's, uh, so it's, 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 it's harder to, it's, it's like a, a um, multi-headed serpent, which it has become now. It's harder to you know, kill the whole system by just talking off one of its heads. So you don't sort of need to attack it on, uh, at more than one place. <coughs> so I've got a question I want to ask the panel um, before we have other questions, um, because I'm interested in what your guys' answer is. Um, so one of the posts Sharon talked about in one of your recent posts was the, the Microsoft scam, where Microsoft, well, somebody reportedly from Microsoft rings you in your home and says, I'm from Microsoft, can you do some things on your, on your computer? Um, and so apparently like this was a scam a few years back and it's just come back recently in the last few days, or a few weeks or so. And I was, when, I was, when I was reading this article, underneath the article there was like, a bunch of things that people had done when it had happened to them. 
and I was talking to them, and some of them was like really quite interesting. Like a lot of people say, well, they try to keep them on the phone as long as they can, mm -hmm. you know, just to like bug them or you know make them angry. And, and so, so, which I thought was, which I've actually done myself. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was one thing, um, especially if you're more clever about computer science than the person you're talking to. It's kind of quite easy to string them along. So that was one thing, and then another thing was that um, you know, some people suggested that they speak really quietly so that they turn their volume up and then get a whistle and hear the whistle really loud. And, and I was thinking, well, you know, I did some referee and I've got a referee's whistle, maybe I could do that. And then I saw this other guy, he said that um, whenever they ring them up, he, uh, he asked them what underwear they're wearing. And it was kind of like, so that they mistakenly think, you know, they they bring up some guy who's kind of a little bit sick and then they shouldn't be speaking to him. And now I'm kind of thinking, well, that could be quite funny, but I don't know, maybe that's not kind of a good approach. So, so my question, my, my question to you guys. We have so questions for you, actually. <laughs> so, if I'm at home and I get a phone call and I know it's someone trying to scam me, what do you suggest I do? Hang up. Yes, I agree. <laughs> hang up? Hang up. Okay. Don't engage, hang up. Thanks a lot. Find out about it. It does, but yeah. Best response, hang up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any thing? Thanks for follow up. I mean, if you're just weary in any way, uh, you get an email or something, or you, know, you go to immigration gov or immigration hyphen gov. You contact. Who do you contact? Nitsai. Nitsai. Well, Nitsai will be able to give you some advice because they're up to date with the current scams that are happening. Um, you can also report to the police. Yeah. So maybe this. Andy, can you just stand up and introduce Chris. Chris, sorry. Chris, stand up and introduce yourself. <laughs> Explain if we need to get in touch with NetSafe, what's the best way for us to do that? Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I wouldn't expect to talk. Here's <laughs> Sharon Talk. Um, you can contact us on our free phone number 0508 NetSafe. You can email us. You can uh, lodge a report through the org website, which is the org.org.nz. Um, from NetSafe who do do a fabulous job but it would appear that one of the biggest gaps here in this country is that there's nobody in a position to actually be doing something proactive. So you suspect you may be being scammed, is there somewhere you can go where some sort of action can be taken to either lure the scammer in, to expose the scammer, to do those sorts of things? To my knowledge that's a big gap. Um, and you know, I hope over time we do get into a position where people like myself, you know, other victims of scams who are prepared to stand up and fight this are able to work alongside of the police or alongside of other organisations to actually begin to do some proactive work to stop the scams before there's some sort of dire consequences. Yeah. What kind of work has been done for us? Netsafe, <laughs> again, Just come back to Netsafe. So Netscape, uh, Netscape, uh, Netsafe <laughs> uh, um, uh, funded to talk to the schools, primarily high schools, is it Chris? And? Uh, we're going to focus on intermediate. Oh, intermediate. Uh, high school, most people are poor with the parents talk. Um, <laughs> no, no, we're funded by the Ministry of Education to do education in schools. My colleague Lee will probably go to three of them four different schools around the country uh, every week. She's out on the road recently. So um, there is talk of doing a financial literacy program as well around scams in particular. The um, sorted people do campaign collapse in one week as well. Because you know, like Sharon said, we're at 8.7 million 
Yeah, actually, uh, yes, uh, we have research on, on that as well. That we try to understand how scammers or hackers uh, work or what in mind. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah, but I could say that uh, somehow it's not easy to, you know, to capture all their psychology. My pattern we call signature. Signature of the yeah, oh, yeah. yeah the criminal. Mm -hmm. It's still open interest <coughs> in research. If you say. Yeah. 
just to add um, to what Ingrid was saying before, I know not long after my arrest, um, the woman used to, uh, excuse the phrase, but take the piss out of me for the mere fact that um, prior to being arrested, I'd never heard or knew what a 419 was. 419 <coughs> is a type of scam. Many of the women I was locked up with, particularly those from South Africa, had all participated and been scammers, and that was a way of life for many of them. So although I've been the victim, I do have a level of understanding as to why people are choosing to become scammers. still say as a generalisation the majority is still very naive and don't fully appreciate nor understand what does happen to the information. If I could add to that, I think the full picture, if then we're at the full picture, I hope that we are, of what a digitalised community looks like is yet to unfold and um, because the rate of uptake is probably far overreaching the rate of research, because um, we're not researchers like it, but it's very much in the snail space, I mean, just saw some stats last year on, for example, the number of smartphone apps, 100 billion of downloads. And there's certainly 100 billion research papers out there to, to cover the, the, the expansive growth, for example. So, you know, I think it's a very rapidly changing um, part of our lives that we're in the midst of at the moment. So the full picture, in my view, is yet to be realised and, and the, what the boundaries of that to look at. Because then we can start making, once we've got quality information about what it looks like, and we can start making quality decisions about laws, where the boundaries of our jurisdiction ends and another begins, that kind of stuff. Also, um, it, uh, it's uh, what Boone started to talk with. Uh, research and technology can only play a little part mm -hmm. uh, in stopping cyber crime and mobile awareness. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we, we need to get awareness at all levels, yes. not, just, not just only intermediate or, or the people in uh, adults, but also uh, uh, at school level. And, uh, So what are, what are the recommendations to protect ourselves and what, what sort of things are coming up in the future that could potentially provide protection to the users? Just, um, I know this is a cliche, but um, you know that old cliche, if something sounds too good to be true, then it probably, you know, stay away from it. And I know that that's really simplistic and it's hard to do when you're probably caught up in it. But you know, if you know the obvious ones, like yeah, someone's going to give you a million dollars, yeah, you know, you think, nah, that's you know pretty obvious, that's a scam. Yeah. But it's some of the more subtle things. But again, I would suggest before you get hooked in, you know, right in there, if something doesn't feel right, then check it out. If you've got a gut feeling something's not right, check it out. You know, there are ways now, and I didn't know this then, and probably. Would, I, would it have made a difference? Probably not. But people like um, Boone, you know, can go in behind and actually see, is this um, signature, I think you called it, or whatever, is this pathway, you know, if this person's telling me they're in London, are they in London? You know, so it, there are a multitude of sites out there now about scammers. You can actually put people's names in there, you can put photos in there, and it will show and bring something up. You can put email addresses in, you can do all of those things, and it's a minute. It's a cost, but it's a minimal cost, maybe five or six dollars, I think, to actually be able to find out if this email address and this person you're corresponding from is on a scammer's watch list. So, 
that would be my recommendation. If you have a niggle of any sort, then pursue one of those websites, put their name in and get it checked out. Okay, so we're, we're almost finished. So um, in the computer science department here at Waikato University, we have a research lab, a research unit, cyber security researchers of Waikato, which yes. bring as one of the lead researchers. Um, and one of the students there has created this um, website. We can do a course and you can upskill yourself on um, the different types of schemes that are out there. Is that correct, Craig? Okay. So, so cyber security training is this website, rifle range. Um, if you want to have a look at this video and you want to learn more, um, <coughs> contact the guys from the cyber research, cyber security researchers of Waikato. Cyber, uh, cyber security researchers of Waikato, they call themselves Pro. Yeah, sorry. I, let me promote the, the lab. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is uh, our lab. You can Google uh, Crow. Yeah. This is the real name. Uh, cool name. Uh, cyber is really uh, researchers of Black Hat yeah. or Crow. Okay, so if we could just thank our panel one more time. Thank you very much.